Thank you for coming and joining us this evening. I'm seeing in the chat that we have some excited folks here in the audience, and I just want to welcome you. My name is Jamie, and I'm part of the power team that brings community programs to you from San Francisco Public Library. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are thrilled that you're here to celebrate our city's biggest summer reading and learning campaign, Summer Stride, with an art talk from our one and only inimitable 2022 artist, Minnie Fan. I hope you're ready to get inspired. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge our community. The area now known as San Francisco is the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone peoples of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the original peoples of this land, the Ramatush Ohlone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place. We recognize that we benefit from living, working, and learning on their traditional homeland. As uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as first peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatish community. This event tonight is part of Summer Stride, the library's annual summer learning, reading, and exploration program for all ages and abilities. Check out the Summer Stride landing page to see our upcoming events, find recommended reading for all ages and more. And be sure to join our Summer Stride Challenge to receive a tote bag with a mini fan illustration. 20 hours, just as a reminder, 20 hours of any library activity. And that means reading books, listening to audiobooks, streaming films on, can films on Canopy, and attending programs just like this one count towards those 20 hours. There'll be a link in the chat. So just make sure that you are going ahead and you're participating in this amazing program. Next, I just want to give a huge, huge thanks to the friends of the SFPL for their generous support of this entire program series. We could not do this without them. Okay, first, I want to tell you just a little bit before she comes and joins us. I just wanna give you a little bit about our star artist before we get going. Minnie Fan is an illustrator who's based in Oakland, California. She is passionate about storytelling and inclusive image making with a unique focus on diversity. Her work ranges from editorial illustrations to comics, animation, and posters. When she isn't illustrating, she teaches Bay Area youth how to create comics. She plays with her adopted bunny Momo and advocates for safer streets for bicyclists and cats. Without further ado, please take it away. Mini. Hello, everyone. Hi. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much, Jamie, for the fabulous introduction. And thank you to Christy for organizing such fabulous programming um, for the summer. Um, I am so excited to be here. And I have a presentation for everyone. Um, so let's get to it. Okay. So we're gonna view this slide. Okay. Um, first, thank you everyone for showing up to this event. It is such a dream and a pleasure. And I'm just so grateful that I get to be exactly where I am right now. And how did I get here? Who am I? Why am I so special? Um, so a little bit about me. Um, so my name is Minnie. I'm an illustrator, cartoonist. Um, I was born in Stockton, California. I'm one of five children, and my parents are refugees from Vietnam. Um, this is a picture of me at one of the five elementary schools I attended in my childhood. I can see I've been making art from a very young age. And my parents um, are, as I mentioned, they're refugees. And a lot of who I am comes from them. I give them so much credit for instilling in me work ethic and determination. Um, my parent, my father's first job when he came to America was among migrant farmers in the San Joaquin Valley. And he picked cucumbers and was paid um, by weight of the crate. Um, and even with that money, a house full of uncles, aunties, you know, all working, putting in money, they still needed a, a, a roommate to pay rent living in Stockton. Um, so we really started from the bottom, um, started from with very little in our hands, even in our brains. Um, my, uh, my parents weren't given the opportunity to have an education. Uh, my mom has a, a third grade education and my dad has a fifth grade education, but they did not let them hold that, that hold them back. 
Um, they were still able to thrive in America. They put five kids through college. They worked really hard and they, they really sacrificed everything for their children. Their children won them being me. And so what did I decide to do? I went to art school. Um, this is a photo of me, my freshman year of um, college at the De Young, which is my first time going to there. <clears throat> and I chose to pursue art because at my core, I was an artist. I've always felt most safe um, when I'm drawing and painting and making things with my hands. It just felt so natural. Um, I've been drawing since I was a little kid, as I mentioned, and here's some drawings from middle school, which is so embarrassing, but my delightful um, presentation attendees get to view my early works. Um, and I was a, a kid from a working class family, so I did not take art kids as a kid or have any special exposure. I just loved to draw and drawing was very accessible. All it took was paper and pencil and um, creativity, imagination. And I just loved, I loved getting lost in my imagination. Um, and my art clearly reflected where I was uh, at the time in my life. Um, I loved anime and manga and cartoons and comics. So I drew that kind of stuff. Um, and I drew because it was fun. I didn't think about it being a career or being, um, you know, this future thing I was going to do. I did it because I loved it. Um, but of course, like any young budding um, a budding young adult, I also experienced roadblocks to my true self. Um, this is me as a little kid. And, um, you know, I, I look back at these photos of me and I, and I, I have these memories, um, especially in early high school, where I stopped drawing because of the people I hung out with. Uh, my friends were my bullies. They would say that anime is an art. They laugh at my drawings. Um, they would even say pretty, you know, racist, sexist, harsh things to me. Um, that I didn't, I didn't know how to process as, um, you know, a second generation American, as a young, a young girl. Um, and they, the people who I surrounded myself that were not good in my life, um, they really, um, they watered the self-doubt that was planted in me. Um, but I'm really grateful that I, I did find people who could see the potential in me. And that includes my high school art teacher, Mr. Doyle. Um, actually, he is the reason why I, I kept pursuing art. He encouraged my creativity, guided me to safer spaces, and always had his classroom open during lunch so that I had somewhere to go. And I think the story is familiar to a lot of artists. You find the people who um, you find your community, you find the places that feel good, that feel right. Um, I know that there are a mix of people watching this video from this presentation from some of my, my wonderful friends to some young budding artists. Um, and I, and I, I want for people to see my story and recognize that um, I, that, that I am not someone who is groomed to be, you know, where I am, that I'm a product of my community of the people around me. Um, and it really does start with Mr. Doyle, who was my first role model, my first art teacher, um, and gave me a sense of home while I was at school. Um, he also taught me the basics of art, the foundational drawing skills, which at the time I hated. I really, I really hated um, the realistic drawing because it wasn't cartoons, it wasn't anime. I had no idea how to apply these skills to what I love to do. But looking at this now, you know, I'm, I'm really impressed with myself that I, I, I did my best, that I tried, and, and that I, I, um, I, I leaned into discomfort, which I think taught me a lot about my work. Um, and also um, having that relationship with him broaden my world to a whole nother, um, I, it broadened me to a world of art that I didn't know was possible. And one of those worlds was pre-college. Um, this is a picture of me at 16. Uh, this is actually after the very first day of, of pre-college, which is at many different universities. They offer a one month program where you can earn college credit while studying a field that you're interested in. Um, and so CCA, California College of the Arts, in Oakland, in, in Oakland and San Francisco offer an illustration class. Um, so I applied and got in. And when I told my parents the good news, they responded, we can't afford it. 
And the month long, the month long program cost $3,000 and my parents barely had enough to keep our family afloat. So there was no way they could find $3,000 for me. Um, and so I took matters into my own hands. I fundraised, I wrote emails, I made phone calls. Um, I, I knew I wanted to, to go to this program and I, I used the resources that I saw available um, that, that Mr. Doe helped me find as well. And actually it was just the day before the payment was, was um, rec- uh, due from the school. Um, I was awarded, awarded a partial scholarship from the Pleasanton community. Um, and it was the first time I experienced the thrill of achievement. It was the first time I really set my eyes on something and reached out to my community and, and you know, put in the effort to get, to, get, to achieve a goal as opposed to, you know, accepting a no or accepting that I can't do something. Um, I, I, it, it made me so confident that I could do it. Um, and it was an amazing experience. It was, uh, pre-college was amazing to my teen self. I had my first figure drawing experience. I went to San Francisco for the first time. I went to a museum. I was really nervous and socially awkward, but it was fun and valuable. And it opened my eyes to art school. And it was the first time I commuted. Um, I traveled on BART for an hour each way, every day to class for a month. And I just felt very grown up. I was 16. I mean, I look back like 16. What were we all doing at 16? Um, and, and going to a program where I'm surrounded by young people, creative people, teachers, it fueled my love for art. And so I came back with an even stronger desire to be an artist. And again, showing, <laughs> showing people this art is very embarrassing, but for, <laughs> for those who tune in, you get to see all this old work from high school. Um, I think also to humanize who I am, right? I, I have the privilege of being a professional artist, but I started out just like any other teenager who loved to draw. And I remember all these pieces. I remember collecting the newspaper at Ranch 99 <laughs> to make this collage. And I remember scanning the pages of my, my journal to make this self-portrait, one of like three self-portraits I'd made in high school. It was one of my first few times painting. Um, And also I was so motivated that I made art not only in school, but outside of school as well. And so I I drew as much as I could in my free time. I made comics, cartoons, I posted art online. back in the day when deviant art was very popular and, and you could easily find an artist community. Um, I think to heal from the bullying that I experienced in my early teen years, I needed to, I needed to pour myself into what I loved. I needed to not be ashamed of loving what I do. Um, and so I, I jumped, I jumped right headfirst into art and, and it was um, one of the best things I chose to do for myself um, because it led me to choosing to go to art school, which I applied to senior year. And I was accepted into art schools across the US, um, which was amazing. I had never done the college application bef- applications before. N- not many in my family had. Uh, my, my, my parents, again, did not have the privilege to go to school. So, you know, they, they just hoped that we would make it. You know, they, they didn't know how it was going to happen, but they just really hoped that if they just loved this enough and gave us shelter and food and, you know, resources that they could do it or we could do it. Um, but um, yes, thank, thankfully my teachers helped me. Um, but when I told my parents that I got into art school, a private art school, which at the time cost maybe $50,000 to attend a year, it was just so much money. My parents, they responded again. They said, we can't afford it. So again, I fundraised. I applied to every scholarship at my high school. Um, I attended every single meeting on FAFSA and Pell Grants. Um, and because I was a woman of color from a poor family, I had to advocate for myself. Um, I had to speak up. And thankfully, the Pleasanton community responded to my passion. Um, Thanks to the Amateur Valley Scholarship Fund and generous donors, I was awarded a $10,000 scholarship, which um, on top of um, Pell Grants, um, other school grants, and a little bit of student loans, I was able to afford my journey at um, California College of the Arts. And anyone anyone who's watching who is in this photo, I just really want to take the moment to thank everyone 
every one of you <laughs> in this photo, um, especially those in the back row, they were the ones who organized the scholarships, they raised money, um, they, they, they put in um, funds from different charitable things, and they help kids like me make dreams come true. Um, so if you're a teenager watching this and listening and wondering, hey, how can I be an artist? Well, how can I do that? Um, I really encourage you to not be held back by money. Um, and there are many there are many ways to be an artist, not just art school, whether you go to a state school or um, another program. Um, there are a lot of resources available and you can find it at the library, at your local school, your community center, whatever place of faith you go to. There are resources, so don't give up. So what was my experience in art school like? Um, while I, having had such a hard journey to get there, jumped in. Um, my parents weren't exactly happy about my decision to study art. I mean, they had they knew no one who was an artist. They, they had no idea what it even meant to be an artist. But the truth is that their tenacity, their audacity to dream is what inspired me to strive. Um, I dare to want more in life because they did. And what did I, what did wanting more look like? It meant living life and being ambitious. It meant being ambitious. So that meant joining clubs, creating clubs, making friends, making art, um, exploring everything around me and really taking in my experience. I think anyone who knew me at, the at this time in, in art school, they knew I was a really hardworking person. And I think a large part of that was, I was really aware from the beginning that to be where one is, especially in a privileged place, like a private art school, I mean, that's, it's not, not just anyone gets to be here. So I, I valued every moment of it. Um, and I also thrived in the long classes. Um, um, part of art school, all the classes are geared towards art and creativity. So the classes are three to six hours long. So that means, yes, you're drawing for six hours. You have um, figure drawing classes for six hours. You have critiques for three hours. You're really immersed in the creative world and everyone around you is an artist to some capacity, whether they're a, a designer, a sculptor, um, an architect, a painter, um, so many different disciplines all in one place. Um, it really felt like going to art school was the place where I, I, my, I think my, my spirit was really waiting for. Um, in, in high school, I was, I nearly didn't graduate. I, I was struggling so hard and I had, I had felt so lost for so long, but art school made me feel safe. Um, I made some work that I really loved, such as comics um, and exploring that world. And I made some work that was questionable or confusing. Um, this, I don't know if I should even explain it. It was a part of a, 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 a pun class or something, but anyway, we're gonna skip that one pretty fast. <laughs> um, and so um, I, as I mentioned, I dove, I, I dove headfirst into the world of art. And, um, and I think truly you get back what you put in. Um, this is, a photo of me at my junior review. Um, you know, for all the disappointment that I brought my parents for choosing to pursue art, CCA truly changed my life. Um, this event is essentially all the juniors present their work and one is selected for a scholarship and that one person that, that this year was me. Um, and the scholarship, the award includes a scholarship with no strings attached money, which means you can do anything you want, right? So what did I do? Um, so my journey so far has been, I want to be an artist. My parents don't get it. They struggled so hard. I feel so guilty. Well, who am I to get to choose to be happy and live my dreams? And then I asked myself, well, who are my parents? So I took that money that I got and I went to Vietnam by myself for three weeks in the summer. And I met my extended family. Um, I, I visited the place that my parents grew up. I I had a life-changing experience where I met a, an, I met people who raised my parents and I realized that my parents were also once children that that the sand that I was standing on is sand that they too once stood on um, and the home that I was sleeping in is the one that my mother grew up in um, and it was amazing it was really incredible and this is me at the pig farm that my um, my uncle runs. Um, and I'm holding my very first pig, which is so cute. Um, 
And I don't know why I was selected for the scholarship at CCA. I don't think I was the best artist in my class. Technically speaking, I was still learning color and value and all the basics of art, but I had a lot of passion. And I think in the art world, that outweighs talent. Um, I think discipline, diligence, hard work, determination will always surpass something, something as I think malleable or, or, or hard to define as talent. You know, when someone says, oh, you're an artist, you're so talented, what does that really mean? Uh, I think when someone's a great artist, it means that they've put in the hours and they work really hard. Um, and a, another thing that going to Vietnam by myself taught me was that life was a gift and that I would be an artist forever. I think that really, imp- it really solidified that Creativity was more than just a career. It was a way of seeing the world and feeling the world and being in the world. Um, I never felt so tiny in a big country with so much history, so many kind people, such incredible skies. And in that moment, I also decided that I cared less about cool and more about being alive that I didn't care if I was perceived as this impressive, cool, tough person. Um, To be a genuine, happy, loving person was enough because I looked around me and and even though the people in this country and my family who live here didn't have the material goods that Americans have, they had a lot of happiness, a lot of community, a lot of sense of of togetherness. And I, I, I wanted to take that home with me. I also want to take home stories. So I made my thesis about my family and our journey. I illustrated, I created 15 illustrations um, documenting um, my experience with identity, um, with going to Vietnam, learning about my parents, hearing their story, unraveling trauma. And it got a lot out of my system. I, I got to really, I got to write a love letter to my parents in a way, in a language that I and them could understand. Um, I don't really speak the perfect best Vietnamese and they don't speak the best English, but a picture is hard to deny. Um, recently at a wedding, uh, we had a little family gathering and my dad took out this book with this project, which has been, it's almost been a decade since I made it. And, you know, he's showing all these guess that we have my art as a way of explaining his journey and it was the first time I saw that and it made me feel really special and it wouldn't have happened without a CCA and b all the folks who supported this project through um, Indiegogo and um, you know helping with the printing so I mean my journey's been full of lots of communities so thank you so much to those who supported this project so how did I go from graduating from art school? <laughs> this is a picture of my family and I, of my graduation. So how did I go from graduating from art school to becoming um, a full-time illustrator in this year's Summer Stride Artist? Um, I wanna repeat that this, my story is just one of many. Um, there are, there's no right way to be an artist, whether you're paid to do it or you do it as a passion hobby, um, or if you go to art school or state school or whatever. There are many journeys, but this was my journey. Okay, so after art school, I took all types of work. This is actually my very first project out of school. It was three months after graduation. I was hired by a local magazine to illustrate a a map of Lake Merritt. And it's in a style that's so different from what I did for my college thesis, but it was a lot of fun. I think there's a part of me that because I got to process so many emotions through realistically painting my family, that just getting to draw a goose <laughs> or getting to draw bikes um, was really fun. It's, and I think that's a part of healing from trauma as well as embracing fun and joy in life. Um, and also while I was taking on um, freelance projects, I also took on gallery work. Um, this is for spoke art, uh, a picture or, or piece about um, Miyazaki. Mizaki's work, so it's a tribute show. Um, and in all of my work, I'm exploring and trying new things. I think I was still searching for my voice um, through all the work that I was doing. Although, I mean, people can argue our voice always exists, but for me, I remember feeling like I was still, I still had so much to learn post-art school. Um, 
And also to be fully transparent, I also had day jobs. I worked many part-time jobs while juggling um, freelance illustration at night. And I've worked so many different kinds. My very first one was retail at a small gift shop. Um, but some of the cooler ones I've done is painting uh, sculptures and murals at Fairyland. Um, and that was, that was amazing because I got to meet so many cool people, including Shannon Taylor and um, uh, Reese Santos. I also taught uh, comics and cartoons at Richmond Arts Center. Um, that was really fun to see young, young people and solidified my um, interest in helping youth obtain their goals and, and, and harness their dreams. Um, I've also other jobs I've worked just to give you an idea of, you know, that the journey wasn't just, I got a job and I got paid forever. You know, it was, it was, I had day jobs such as working in vintage clothes, working for a small business, working as, as an assistant at a nonprofit, um, taking on lots of different odd, odd jobs while also taking freelance. And so while, but also it wasn't, freelance didn't just come into my life. It was, it, I got called but not all the time. So when I had my, when I had free time, I was still making work. I made work even if no one called me. I had stories to tell from my heart that I wanted to bring to life. So I worked on self-generated props, generated projects. Um, this is actually a, a book that I illustrated for a solo exhibition I had at the Oakland Asian Cultural Center. Um, and um, this work actually it's amazing that i made this and and i had no idea that in five years someone at an agency um, called writer's house would find my work and reach out to me and decide to represent and seek to represent me for for picture books and other work um so you never know where these kind of projects are going to take you um I made this because i want to tell a story about identity and self-acceptance i did not have any plans to be to to, to you know go it wasn't I'm going to make this and I'm going to get this it was I'm going to make this because I want to I'm going to share it in case it helps someone else and that that's really what motivated me and what did it look like to get my work out there in the world it includes making art to post online on social media Instagram Twitter etc and also going in person um, to events this is me in 2015 at my very first SF Zine Fest. And you can see it's so much early work. My work from college and me just figuring it out. I had, didn't even have a display. I just put everything down <laughs> on flat on the table. Um, but it was my first experience interacting with other people in my work. And, it, and it, I think it made me hungry for more. So I did this for a few more years and my display grew from this to this. Um, it, I made more work. I displayed more. I also made more money through the work um, that it all went back to itself. Um, I really was not trying to make this type of work my life. It was more, I want to get my name out there. I want to share my stories. And if it reaches someone, it'll reach someone. Um, and the some, someone, well, some really great people have reached out to me. I cut my teeth on music posters. I've done 10 for the Fillmore in San Francisco. I've illustrated for musicians such as Mitski and um, Yola Tango, um, Johnny Swim, Years and Years. The list goes on and on. Um, it's been really pretty awesome. And every time I do a poster, I get free tickets to the concert. So I that, that's pretty great. Um, and I, I've always had a lot of fun with the posters. Um, I also have been able to do work um, for uh, political campaigns, such as this voting image um, and cookbooks and, and other um, Asian Pacific Islander um, organizations. And through all of this, I'm teaching myself. If you notice in art school, I was using a lot of traditional media and I actually taught myself digital tools after college. I taught myself how to use Photoshop and Procreate and textures and colors. It was nonstop learning, but mostly because it was fun. I think it was cool to challenge myself and, and do something different and, and discover and explore. Um, so I, I, I encourage that if you have a skill you wanna um, get better at, don't be afraid to start. 
Um, I think as we get older, what we want is not to experience something, but to be impressive, right? To say, oh, I know how to play guitar, but it's really hard to be bad at the guitar, right? But if you start out bad, you're going to eventually get good. So don't be afraid of starting, just do it. Um, another project that I got to do that I really love is um, more comics. Um, this is for Abrams book called Drawing Power. And um, it actually won... Um, it was part of an anthology that won an Eisner Award and was also mentioned by the New York Times. So remember at this time, I'm, I'm, I have day jobs, I'm juggling um, all types of work, trying to pay my rent while also taking on freelance. Um, and, and all of the work that I do slowly goes towards what I want to do. And that includes exploring with color, medium, risograph, watercolor, and working in a style that I, I find really joyful. Um, these are some of my favorite pieces that I'm showing. And it also means experimenting, learning how to animate, teaching myself animation. Um, these pro this project on the right, the, the two characters is for a sticker pack that I wanna make for um, the iPhone, which is halfway through. I'm hoping I'll find some time to work on it. Um, and it's really, it's, I think it's the way that I keep myself interested, that I don't want to feel like I've stagnated or, or become bored of my work, that I can always find something fun and new to do. And I also continue to make comics. Um, and all of this work and all this exploration has led me to finding a stronger voice, a stronger identity, having more fun, being more playful, using color and attracting the eye of people who want to get my work out to other people. And so I, um, I was contacted in, in 2019 by Andrea Morrison of Writer's House and she became my agent. Um, and in 2020, at the, at the height of the pandemic actually, I decided, you know, my business grows every year, it doubles every year and I can do this. So I quit my job and I became a full-time freelance illustrator and I jumped into it. I just went for it and I believed in myself and it's all worked out. <laughs> I think it really has. So I've illustrated several book covers. Um, the most recent one is Gabe in the After, which is coming out um, at the end of this month. Harvey, which came out um, in April and was part of how I was selected for Summer Stride. Um, and then upcoming in spring 2023 is a book called The Yellow Aoyai, which is written by Hen Boy. Um, and she um, is she's so inspiring because she's a first time writer. And I think she's also evident evidence that it doesn't matter when you make a dream come true. You know, you can have many lives and you can have many dreams. Um, and, to, and it's not about making it young. It's about staying, it's about being, staying true to yourself. So this book, um, I just finished illustrations. It'll be coming out in 2023. So I look forward to sharing more with that about that with you all. Um, and so I've been, I've made art. I've, I've, you know, been able to explore my tools. But what else has illustration brought me? Where else have I gone? Well, I've gone camping with a lot of cartoonists, which has been amazing. Um, I've been a special guest at the Charles Schultz Museum in Santa Rosa. I've given a commencement speech at my um, college. I've done a panel discussion at Google. I even painted a mural at Google. Um, it, it's been incredible that I get to do all of this. Um, and it's all because of the work that I have dedicated myself to. And, and I, I think often about what Min Jin Lee, who wrote Pachinko, what she says about creativity. That if you want to be an artist or a writer in this world, don't think about the fame or the for fortune or the recognition or any of that external stuff. Think about the message. Think about the why. You have to have a compelling why. And my why was that I wanted to make my life something that I loved. And I wanted to make art not for a career, as a, not as a career, but for a lifetime. Um, and and also I, I love what being an artist means. It means that I can travel and, and still make art. I had the privilege with my partner, Doro. Um, they, 
are a optometrist and they decided they well they have a very powerful connection to the crow people in montana so we moved to this cabin for eight months right by the river and i still got to be an illustrator i took all my work and i set up my table and i painted i illustrated the entire harvey book at this cabin in rural montana the closest town population of three thousand people but because of the work that I get to do, it was possible. Um, I also got to teach comics to kids on the res. Um, and, and I really pinch myself that this gets to be my reality. This is my work. Um, and maybe best of all, I went from being on a bus <laughs> to making art for the bus. <laughs> it's a pretty great. Um, and so here I am now in 2022. I am the illustrator this year for Summer Stride. Then that means that I have illustrated, or I, my art is on hundreds of muni um, bus stops, shelter, transit shelters, buses. Um, it means that my art is on 28 buildings across San Francisco, 28 library buildings. And um, there's tons of merchandise. There's 75,000 activity trackers, 20,000 tote bags, 30,000 bookmarks, all these, this official um, um, reading ranger badge from the National Park Service um, and a gallery show with art. And as you could see from earlier, all this original art is stuff I made in Montana. It was pretty cool. Um, and then also this gallery show, which it's called nights and weekends because I really made my career through nights and weekends. I, I wasn't given the privilege to just go full time. I didn't have the financial support of my parents. I had to struggle really hard, but that makes where I am that much more delicious. It really makes it so worthwhile that I did it. I never gave up. There's, um, there were many times of doubt and fear and uncertainty, but I kept going. I didn't stop. So I'm, I'm glad to be able to share my story. And I wanna end my presentation with one um, section of the gallery show, which is advice, advice to my younger self. Because I pinch myself every day that I am where I am. And I think that my younger self was so full of doubt that she never knew if, if she'd really make it, if someone would love her, if she was deserving of the life that she gets, that she wants. So I would say to myself, believe in yourself, dream big, drink water, care less about what's cool and more about what makes you feel alive. Immerse yourself in what you love, feel the thrill of achievement. Loving yourself means taking care of yourself. If you can't find your community, make one. And regardless of what you want, remember this slowly but surely. And that's it. <laughs> that's me and my world. And thank you so much for tuning in, for learning about me, for giving me a chance to share my story. And please, if you'd like to stay in contact, um, this is my Instagram handle, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, and I'll be answering questions after this. So we're gonna bring Jamie back on screen and she will share some questions and such. Minnie, I just want to say thank you so much. And I feel as though there's thanks rolling in, you know, everyone who's watching, um, your generosity in sharing your story, the incredible images that, you know, you've created throughout the span of your life um, and your photos have just been so powerful. And I just encourage everyone to keep that little eye spy out across San Francisco because the joy that Minnie is bringing to, you know, to our cityscape here is just incredible. You can check out that exhibit that Minnie has been sh showing us um, throughout um, at the main library and civic center. It's right outside the main children's center. And just looking at the detail, the precision, the beauty of Minnie's work is incredible. So make sure you come on by and you, and you see her work. It's, it's amazing. Okay, Minnie, we do have some, some questions popping in. So are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> Wonderful, all right. So um, one question is, do you have a favorite medium right now to work in? 
You know, I, I would say my favorite medium is watercolors, but I do not get the chance to work in it very often. Um, I actually really love the work in Harvey because I feel like Chronicle utilized what I love the most, which is black and white, watercolor, graphite, ink, and with like a color cover. So I got to have the best of both worlds with doing traditional media and doing digital work. Um, lately, I've been working with um, Photoshop and Procreate just because of time and speed, but I love watercolor and anyone who's watching wants to, you know, let me have the time and, and space to make use traditional media. That's what I really love. Fantastic. Um, another question is, where do you draw your inspiration from? Are there cartoonists or illustrators out there who have influenced your style? Oh boy. Okay. This is, this is, you got, everyone's got to sit down and get a, get their dinner right now and <laughs> get ready to listen. Um, I would say my inspiration comes in phases, but one that has always been a huge part of my life is um, Taiyo Matsumoto. I actually have a tattoo of his work because I love it so much. Um, if you like movies, Taekon Kinkri is a fabulous animated movie. Um, I love his storytelling, his comics, his art. So he's a huge inspiration. Um, wow, I, have, I mean, I have so many people suddenly in my mind I wanna, I wanna shout out. Um, but I see favorite cartoonist, I mean, Favorite artists, Julian Tamaki, writer, Marco Tamaki, um, Reina, Reina Telgemeier is so amazing. Um, just so many fabulous people who, who give me a lot of inspiration. Lately, it's been writers, actually. I, I love, I, so I'm a visual person. I've been into comics and storytelling visually for most of my life, but lately I've been discovering the world of writing. And so I've been very inspired by Vitan Nguyen, who didn't write his first book until he was 54. Um, uh, Min Jin Lee, who, who wrote her first book in her 50s as well. Um, the writer of um, The Kite Runner, Khalid, is that? Yeah, he, he didn't write his first book until his 40s. I mean, I love to know that one's career has no age. It doesn't matter when you tell your story, what kind of art you make, what matters is making it and telling your story. So I would say my biggest inspiration right now are writers. And if ever, if ever one who is young feels like, oh no, I haven't made it, I'm nobody. Just look up a list of late bloomers. It's gonna make you feel better because there's no such thing as when a career blossoms, like you know the right time. It happens anytime, any day. That is amazing. And may I just ask, are you ever dabbling in writing yourself? Like, do you do any journaling, like that kind of thing? Is that part of your, your dream maybe one day? Absolutely. So my, my goal for a long time was I want to be an illustrator. And now that I am an illustrator, I think the next chapter is I want to be a writer illustrate I want to do both I want to I want to be a little everyone um one of my big inspirations also is Christian Robinson who um part of my inspiration is looking at artists you know their work 10 years ago and recognizing that it's a journey everyone has a journey and he wrote yeah at the early part of his career he said I'm just an illustrator right now but one day I'll be an author illustrator and he's now written books they're on the New York Times bestsellers list I mean he's a he's an inspiration so yes I do write. I've been writing scripts for um, comics and picture books, and they are all in the works. That is amazing. It gives us so much more to look forward to. I mean, not only your visual arts, but now we can think, you know, one day we're going to see some work from you too that's written. So everyone, just keep your eye out. Um, another question. Oh, by the way, folks, um, we do have some book lists from Minnie that are available from SFPL. She has curated an incredible little bookshelf of graphic novels and other like illustrated works. So make sure that you check out our website for that. Um, let's move into, I actually, I'm kind of curious because I, a little bird has told us that you are having a little collaboration with SF MoMA coming up. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Right. That's right. Yes. So I am working with SF MoMA this year to host two workshops for, um, it's for it's it's particularly for youth, but it's, it's essentially all ages um, and accompanying the workshops, which will also be a coloring book. So I am illustrating a coloring book featuring um, women of color artists who are um, displayed throughout the museum, um, and the work is going to be presented in a illustrated way. Um, and copies will be for free for people, and they'll be able to use the SF um, Summer Stride color pencil that you can win if you get the tote bag. Um, so yes, that collaboration will be live in early to, to mid-July. 
Um, so keep your eyes out. And the events are, um, I believe, the first Sunday, the first or first Sunday and last Sunday, maybe, of um, the SF MoMA. So keep your eyes out for that. That sounds like a dream collaboration and something that's made in heaven. Um, I have a question, which is, okay, so you get a, say, like, hypothetical, you get a call from your agent who says, I have a dream project for you, dot, dot, dot. What do they say next? Oh my God, that's a great question. Um, the budget is, is unlimited. <laughs> that's what they say. No, they say that, um, okay, they say I have a dream project for you and it is a and it is an opportunity for me to collaborate with a publisher to make a graphic novel about my, me and my sister um, or a, a picture book about me and my sister. I actually have a, a book that I'm writing about sisterhood. Um, and I, I think I, I would love an opportunity to be able to tell a story about the experience I have as um, a sister, a community member. Um, yeah. I. Wow, that's a, such a great question. I'm like, there's so many scenarios that could happen. And, and in a way, um, it's already happened. You know, I have received some pretty incredible emails. I have, I am currently working on another picture book that will be coming out in 2024 um, with a very incredible um, figure in the Vietnamese community who I cannot name because I'm not going to jinx it. Um, but I'm really grateful for all that's to come for me down the pipeline. So in a way, I feel like I'm already living the dream. So yeah, I get it. We'll see there's more to come. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. And I know it's it's hard, um, but I know that you have so many dreams. And so it's, it's really cool to hear some of the things that are sort of like brewing your mind or what you might want to work on, you know, in the future, near or far, sometime you know, down the pipe. Um, the question is kind of related. Um, I have uh, one person on the line who's asking, uh, what advice would you give other um, people whose parents don't maybe necessarily approve their dreams just yet? Oh, well, first I want to say, I see you. I see you. It's really hard. Um, it's not easy and it hurts. It really hurts to have the people who love you, who nurtured you from child, from babyhood to now, you know, to say no we don't want that, or no, you can't have that, or no, we don't believe in you. And that's the kind of pain that will stay for a while. Um, and I think it's okay to recognize that it's gonna be there. And what can help in, in these situations? Well, first, I'm a huge advocate of mental health, um, like taking care of one's mental health. So I really suggest therapy, counseling services, um, group therapy, any kind of resources that help with feeling safe and secure, uh, because part of having people not believe in you is then not believing in yourself, right? And we all can, we all struggle with some kind of um, mental health issues. So I suggest a looking for resources. I wouldn't be where I am right now without my therapist. Absolutely. A hundred thousand percent. I'm so grateful for her. Um, and also, um, I mean, it really depends if you, if you have the language skills with your parents, you can speak to them. Then I would say, you know, talk to them and try to explain and show examples and be patient with them. And also understand that it is okay if they don't fully support you. I mean, I, I think about anyone who has to struggle with this from, from being an artist to maybe doing drag and their parents aren't, you know, supportive, that you cannot let someone's no hold you back. In my opinion, when it comes to creativity and expressing yourself and being who you are, what what does adhering to their no bring you ultimately? Um, so yeah, I mean, I say listen to your voice, listen to yourself, and believe in yourself. You can do it, and they're a loss if they can't see it. And I'm sorry that they can't see the beauty that people are. Thank you so much, Minnie. I really appreciate those words, and I know that these are all lessons that you know you you thought about very carefully, and so that means a lot to hear from you. Um, one question that we have is, um, so I think that a theme throughout your talk was about discipline and hard work and mm. how far that's gotten you. Do you have a routine, you know, that you do every single day or do you find that, you know, in terms of like, you know, doing your art, um, 
or do you find that you know do you just sort of like wing it every day like how how do you produce your art in such like a you know just a really disciplined manner whoa okay so i feel a little like um calm the the the, the lights uh, and when you said wing it i was like i think i've been winging it lately um so actually i will say give oneself permission to thrive when you thrive for a long time i felt really guilty about um staying up late i would go to bed at one or two in the morning and i'd be like oh this is not average people and you know folks would say oh i start my day at seven i'm in the office by nine and i'm like i want to be in bed till 10 and i felt so guilty about that for a long time but we cannot stop the creativity when it's there you know it, I, it's been nearly 10 years of me working and i've just noticed either from training from moonlighting as an illustrator or just from personal preference of the world being more quiet when it's nighttime that i just happen i really like um staying up late so i like to get up late and enjoy my morning and then i you know do the the chores of the day and then i work at night so i try to meet up with friends for lunch not dinner that's just what works for me. Um, and I think if you're gonna control your own schedule um, and if you're your own boss, then I would say to embrace what works, take care of yourself. That's something I'm still really learning is prioritize self-care because you cannot burn the candle at both ends. It's just not sustainable. If you're gonna stay up late, so you better sleep in. If you're gonna wake up early, you know, you better get that writing in in the morning or whatever. Um, um, but this, for me, discipline looks like recognizing if i i mean it means making work well a it means making art even when i don't want to because my deadlines are not going to wait for me that if the client says it's due friday and i don't have a legitimate reason as to why i need an extension um then i gotta get that work done right because a part of being an, art, an artist as a profession means that you have to work even when you don't feel the inspiration I think it was Norman Rockwell who said inspiration is for amateurs. Um, but it's really discipline and, and, and structure that makes people create. Um, because I think often starting is hard. It's it's so scary to pick up a pencil or a paintbrush and, and feel like, oh, this blank paper. But once we start working, once we start drawing, the flow begins and it gets so much easier and suddenly hours have passed. But it's the psychological um, block that I think really holds people from, from just getting in it. That is so it's super interesting. The question of inspiration versus, you know, just sort of like setting yourself down and like looking at an assignment and really tackling it and being, you know, just sort of plugging away with that until it, it really happens and you're in the flow. That's really, really cool. Um, you mentioned that you work on concert posters. So one question is, um, do you have a playlist when you work? Do you work, listen to music or like do you just like have like some kind of waves and rain and showers in the background like wait, how does that how does that work for you you know i feel like i've been waiting my whole life to get this question because <laughs> i i love music i i listen to a lot of music i actually kind of tend to really like a lot of stuff i i mean apparently most people listen to listen on repeat for the most of their life the things they listen to in their 20s like your 20s defines the music that you like right but for me i discovered musicals really late in life I mean, like, it was like my mid twenties. I was like, what's the big deal with musicals? And I just fell in love. I think it was Hamilton was the first album that I listened to. And then suddenly I'm listening to like, um, Le Miserable, um, uh, Fiddler on the Roof. And honestly, this is so dorky, but every single project I've worked on, I have either hummed to those albums or listened to those albums. I just love musicals. They're like podcasts. They're podcasts, you know, that's a story, it's an audiobook with music to it. Um, I also just want to shout out Libby. <laughs> if you haven't used the Libby app, if you don't have a library card and you're not listening to free audiobooks on your app, you're missing out. I highly recommend. So, yes, I listen to music, I listen to um, a lot of bands. I, I mean, I feel a little embarrassed listening to the music that I listen to like, um, yeah, I like a lot of rock, alternative, indie music, um, but I also listen to a lot of audiobooks. I was not a reader growing up. I actually have dyslexia very likely, um, so I don't read well, but audiobooks have been life-changing. Like I listened to for the first time, The Joy Luck Club, and that was incredible. And I, it's amazing for me to 
feel like I get to be part of the culture now that I have this other form of access to literature. That's amazing. And thank you for shouting out Libby, which is you know truly something that here at the library love as well. Um, I think we may have time for maybe one more question. So I see that someone in the chat is really interested in Momo. And <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so just, you know, like we had mentioned that Momo is um, Minnie's bunny. And so, you know, I'm just sort of curious, like how does, how does Momo, how is Momo related to your art? Or how is, like, tell us a little bit about Momo and, you know, her effect, her effect on you. Uh, I think Momo is everything. <laughs> She's everything. I mean, honestly, she has taught me so much. When I adopted her, I, I, I was just like, I want a cute white bunny that's going to be so affectionate and loving. And I just so happened to pick a very aggressive bunny who wanted to nibble my fingers and toes. Um, and bless the House Rabbit Society in Richmond, which is a fabulous nonprofit for rabbits. Um, I called them four times, maybe sent them a million emails saying, I can't keep her. She's a demon. She's a soft terror. Um, but I stuck with it. Um, you know what? I'm going to do something so inappropriate. And I'm just going to lift my computer and show you my bunny. There she is. That's my mama. <laughs> that's what we're waiting for. No, that's, that's what we wanted. Anyone who's made it to the very end of this presentation, you know, they really got the truth. They got the treasure. That's that was what we were saving this entire this entire talk. Um, but Momo actually, what's funny is when I talk about identity, um, she kind of became my identity. You know, I I I think when I was a young artist, I drew a lot of like angsty, sad stuff, a lot of faces. And then having a pet that I love so much that gives me so much inspiration, something I'm like, ooh, I want to draw a bunny. You know, and so she became the subject of a lot of my work. And I think I've become like the bunny lady, but I don't mind because I like being the bunny lady. So I love her. She's great. She's she's very important to me. Oh, yeah. And she makes a cameo in um, the Yellow Aoyai, my upcoming picture book um, with Firewell. She is a character in the book. So <laughs> keep your eyes out. If you, yeah, if you pick up the book, please snap a photo and say, we found Momo. And I would also say that if you look carefully at the Summer Stride tote bag this year, you can also spy like a little bit of a bunny presence. You have to kind of like, you know, really look in there, but there is definitely a, like a bunny in there. So everyone check it out. Um, well, I think that, you know, this has been such an amazing share and um, I feel like we've learned so much about you, Minnie, and your journey. Um, certainly these are words that young artists, I think, you know, can take out there and be inspired by. Um, and I don't know, I, I think everyone should sort of go down, go out this summer and do some drawing and sketching and just sort of look at your art and be, you know, like inspired by what you've given us. I just want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. Um, and if you love today's program, please do check out our calendar. The library is alive through August with a ton of opportunities to read, play, and learn together in our bevy of virtual programs. And one more time, please do drop in and see Minnie's exhibit, Nights and Weekends, at the Maine Children's Center. It's full of treasures from Minnie's art studio. She was very generous in sharing some of like the tools of her trade, um, some of the pieces. And so you, I think that all of you will really, really enjoy it. So definitely do that. Um, and elsewise, that's all for this evening, folks. Please take good care of yourselves, stay safe, and we hope to see you at another program. Thank you so much, Minnie. It has been a pleasure talking to you this evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.